Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Rohit Day, an assistant professor of history at Yale University. He is a historian of modern South Asia and is particularly interested in legal history and comparative constitutional law. Professor Day has assisted Chief Justice K.G. Balakrishnan of the Supreme Court of India and has worked on constitution reform projects in Nepal and Sri Lanka. Today we'll talk with him about his forthcoming book, The Republic of Writs, Litigious Citizens, Constitutional Law, and Everyday Life in India, which explores how the Indian Constitution came to permeate everyday life in India during its transition from a colonial state to a democratic republic. Welcome, Professor Day. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Sure. Um, so at its very basic level, the book argues that the Constitution matters. Now, this might seem fairly obvious uh, if you're sitting in the U.S., but in the Indian case, this is not something that's, that's obvious. So, um, India, and why not? Sure. India enacts its constitution in 1950, so three years after independence. Um, it's a constitution that's written by a um, group of elite nationalist politicians. Um, the deliberations are in English and the document is in English, a language that at that point was spoken by less than 5% of the population. And why was that language chosen? Uh, partly to do with the fact that um, the legal system in India under British rule functioned in English, mm -hmm. but also English was picked up as an official language for the Indian state because it's one of those few languages that actually united at least the elites of different parts of the country. I see. Okay. Um, so even when they were writing the constitution, their framers, uh, particularly the chairman of the drafting committee, Dr. Ambedkar, kept referring to the fact that while these co this constitution has all these great ideas, it doesn't reflect the lived experience of, of most of our people. So it's not something that people have charged it by saying this constitution was not organic, it didn't grow out of the society. Um, and I mean, famously, one of the members of the assembly hearing, looking at the constitution said, we wanted the music of the Veena and the sitar, but you've played the music of the English brass band. So mm -hmm. you know, it's a mm -hmm. sense that this is not an Indian constitution. Right. Uh, and a lot of human, I mean, human rights scholars and civil libertarians have pointed out that the constitution actually um, does not necessarily protect individual rights to the same extent that other constitutions do. So while uh, the US constitution was about protecting the citizens from the state, the Indian constitution was made to empower the state to transform society and economy. So all the rights that are given are limited. Uh, there are various grounds in which the rights can be curtailed. Um, and the, the new independent state in many ways looked very much like the colonial state. Mm -hmm. So the judiciary, the police, the jail system, the bureaucracy continued to be the same. You had elections and you had a little system on top, but critics have said it's basically a colonial constitution with a little bit of uh, window dressing uh, on it. Okay. So at, at a fundamental level, I want, at my work looks at, looks at sort of questioning this, this proposition to show how it makes a difference in, re difference in real ways. Uh, I'm specifically interested in, and, and what the book looks at, is how um, very quickly, I mean, within a few years of the Constitution coming into force, it begins to become a part of uh, everyday life and imagination of, um, of, of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I, I trace this through looking at uh, court cases that people bring against the state, okay. and, and looking at what sort of people bring cases and what kind of disputes are brought and how the, the new government reacts to them. Right. What led you to write the book? Um, so I, I trained as a lawyer in India um, initially, and I, and I worked for a bit with, 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 the, with the judge. And uh, there's some kind of paradox that exists in India, but also in other post-colonial countries. Um, so on the one hand, um, you know, you have a system which functions in a language that people don't understand. Um, neither the state nor people necessarily follow the law. Uh, so very often in everyday life you see laws are broken. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uh, what is conventionally seen as you know, a place where, where rules are followed. However, within all of this, the constitution has a great degree of, 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 of importance, both for politicians but also for ordinary people. It creeps up in everyday conversations. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are multiple issues ultimately go and get educated by the court. And there is a sense of, you know, despite all uh, you know, evidence to the contrary, there's a real sense that people continue to engage with this legal system. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of the paradox that I grew interested in. Okay, and then let's elaborate on, on the research you did. So sure. how, many, how many cases did you look at? Uh, I began, I mean, so part of this, um, 
I initially began by looking at going through a, a large amount of, of, of cases that appeared in the 1950s. I was trying in particular to look at a certain kind of cases. So I was looking for um, new policies that the government does mm -hmm. uh, as part of its uh, project of transforming society and economy. Okay. Uh, and, and this is very much the agenda of, of the newly independent government. They're trying to show themselves as different from the colonial state. They're interested in social welfare, economic development. So I was looking at um, these new laws and, when, and, and, and instances where these new laws are challenged. Um, so by the end, when, I, when I'm writing the book, I've sort of zoned in on, on, on certain uh, kinds, of, kinds of laws. Um, and they cut across um, different aspects of everyday life. So, I look at challenges to prohibition in Bombay, uh, okay. and uh, prohibition is an important part of this independent government's plan. It's a promise that's in the constitution, and it's not only seen as this is about uh, you know creating healthy workforce, you know preventing um, um, the evils that drink causes in families, mm -hmm. but also a real sense that drink was a foreign, uh, you know alcohol was a foreign um, sort of poison in India. Um, Gandhi spoke about this very often. Um, you know, uh, and the government made a lot of revenues out of selling liquor. Mm -hmm. So the sense that this is sort of tainted revenue, and we are going to stop it, and we are also going to curb uh, prohibition practices. Okay. And and this gets challenged in courts in interesting ways. So, okay. Uh, and so talk about that a little bit. What sure. kind of interesting ways? So people were not happy that yeah. um, they weren't going to be able to drink anymore. Of course, <laughs> as, as you can imagine. Um, and you know, a vast number of people continued to drink anyway. Uh -huh. um, there were there was bootlegging and um, just like in driving, this country, like like in the U.S. in the 20s and 30s. But what was interesting is um, almost as soon as the con so the prohibition goes into force a year before the constitution. Mm -hmm. As soon as the constitution goes into force, um, a public spirited citizen sort of walks to court and says. Um, this new law violates my fundamental rights uh, to liberty and to property under the Constitution. And uh, he argues, uh, for instance, um, um, that um, he, makes, uh, he makes a range of arguments, but uh, he points out, for instance, that the fact that um, the states creates exceptions. So the prohibition law allowed uh, foreigners and the army to continue to drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, a lot of the argument was about how can you treat these two groups differently? You have to treat all Indians equally, so this violates the right to equality. Um, and the courts took this very seriously, and there was a lot of public interest in this. But what was interesting to me is not that this man went to court, but how surprised the government was. So in a way, the independent government never really thought that uh, its projects are going to be challenged in court like mm -hmm. this. There was a real sense that we are, uh, you know, after after hundreds of years, a democratically elected government representing the will of the people, and now we have, um, you know this sort of pesky individual who comes up to the court. Um, so the court sort of struggles to balance, you know, clearly a democratic government's mandate and um, um, this individual and ultimately says, well, you can have prohibition, but you can't sort of ban alcohol in all its forms. So one of the things the government had did were, done was it even said things like if you had medicine with alcohol in it or a mouthwash with alcohol in it, that would also be illegal and prohibited. Mm -hmm. So you would think ordinarily this is not a big victory. You know, the state wins, they win a small loophole. But then I find all these cases where they arrest people who have been driving and they say we can smell alcohol on your breath. And uh, the individual claims, well, I just had mouthwash or I had medicinal wine. And there's almost no way to sort of prove that they didn't. Right. And there's an explosion in the production of these commodities because of this one small wow. loophole that this individual has, has mm -hmm. carved out. So uh, it's also a story about, you know, there's a conventional narrative of how we imagine court cases to function. You go in and you win a right or you don't win a right. Mm -hmm. But very often it's not about winning in court, it's about what possibilities that opens up and what right. loopholes become available. So by the 60s, the government in Bombay had to sort of wind up its prohibition program because there were so many sort of loopholes Loophole. picked in and, and there was constant litigation about, about these loopholes as well, all of which were sort of relying on certain basic constitutional principles. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, um, what, so what other ways um, has the Indian constitution come to dominate um, public life? Sure. Um, so there's a couple of other uh, um, specific examples. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, um, just to give you, I mean, a, a little bit of, of how the Indian Constitution works mm -hmm. now. Um, uh, I mean, as a document, it's something that's, that's been amended a fair number of times. But India today has one of the world's most powerful Supreme Courts. It's a court that sort of that's appropriated several powers to itself over the years. It's withstood challenges from the executive. Um, the court can review legislation, create, it has created new rights. It has also, in some cases, sort of legislated policy from the courts. It appoints its own judges. And all of this is because um, uh, there's a sense that 
there's this constitutional domain that it's very hard for the pol politicians to interfere. So it's it's become a, a you know almost a separate field of politics in itself. Mm -hmm. um, most major policy decisions end up being taken to the court. So uh, I mean, um, humorists would say it's basically Supreme Court of India that runs runs the country, except for when you know the elections take place. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but um, uh, uh, more broadly, in the period I'm looking at, what's interesting is this is not this is not this has not yet happened. Uh, there's a new system that's been put into place, and people aren't sure what the rules are mm -hmm. going to be or how this new object of the constitution is going to work. Um, it's because we're talking b back the in 1950s. the 1950s, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, what what happens fairly quickly is that it becomes both sort of a organizing assumption. So when people are making decisions, when uh, businessmen are making policies, when um, housewives are going shopping, when uh, so there's a sense that you know that the system exists and there is, there is a way through which you can work through it. So it mm -hmm. helps you take your decisions. And quite soon for the government, the constitution becomes sort of a threat. So now they've begun to almost anticipate, within four or five years, they begin to anticipate constitutional challenges and keep trying to find ways of you know, creating this bulletproof law that cannot be taken to court, right. but it invariably always is. Uh -huh. so, uh, uh, so it's a period of which begins with uncertainty, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's what keeps it going. So it's not as if the Constitution is um, necessarily liberating for the general public or uh, necessarily oppressive. Neither side really knows what's going to happen, right. but it's clear that it can really change things. Right. So um, it, it, it influences how people lead their daily lives in many ways. I mean, it is interesting because it, it, it is a brand new document, yeah. for one. Two, it's, it's not in a language that most people understand. And that really interests me because, because it sounds like the common everyday person is like, you know, getting the Constitution and, and reading through it, but yet they don't under, they cannot read English. So how is that happening? So, I mean, the, the, the part, there are two, two bits to the puzzle. One, of course, is the role that lawyers play. Okay. So India, compared to uh, several other um, British colonies at the time, really has a large number of lawyers. Okay. Uh, many of whom have been involved in the nationalist movement, but most of them are just people who are, you know, working in, working in a town or a village and looking to make, raise an income. Sure. When the constitution comes into force, initially it's quite instrumental. So uh -huh. a client comes to you with a problem. The argument is the government shutting my shop down. Um, Previously, you could have done, you had options A, B, and C, but now you have this new option of okay. the Constitution. So there's a real sense that lawyers become, in a way, um, missionaries for the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've traced a little bit about how this legal knowledge spreads, so looking at uh, law publishing and circulation of textbooks. Okay. Uh, I mean, the other story really here is that of the media. So um, trials make the news. So even if um, uh, people don't read the Constitution, um, Either they read a newspaper, right. or uh, in India, it's, it's quite common that someone reads out the newspaper to them in, in a public space. So okay. um, every newspaper is not just read by someone who buys it, but there's also another group that gets um, exposure to it. So many of the cases I look at become sort of big media stories, and you see cases following very quickly. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the cases I see involves a vegetable vendor in a small town in North India who finds this new way of challenging municipal regulations. Mm -hmm. And within the next few months, you start noticing in all the neighboring towns, sort of vegetable vendors making the same argument. So clearly, news spreads sure. and people learn that there's new tactic to do it. Mm -hmm. um, Very interesting. You also talk about certain marginal groups and um, how the constitutional culture in the 50s was shaped by them. Talk a little bit about uh, the groups and, and how they shaped. Sure. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, I mean, much of the critique of law everywhere is that law is a tool that's used by the rich and, and the wealthy. And um, even in the Indian cases, uh, a significant number of people who go to court are uh, middle class or, or, or wealthy. And, uh, but what surprised me was there was a substantial, it's a minority, but a substantial minority of groups who you would think of as marginal or subaltern. So just to name a few, they're butchers, they're vegetable vendors, mm -hmm. they're prostitutes, uh, or women who go up and very clearly say we are prostitutes, um, beggars, um, uh, people who were clearly smuggling, uh, mm -hmm. uh, people who marked as criminal of, of, of some kind. And um, in a way, one of the arguments I make is that what we take is some of the principles of constitutionalism really get shaped through, through these cases. Um, for instance, what? So, um, for instance, the idea that um, the government can't delegate um, unrestricted authority to a magistrate in a town. So the magistrate's authority must have certain curbs to it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it happens through these cases is um, very often these individuals go in and they make a, a claim to a right. 
uh, and the right, the, right, the right really isn't carried through. So for example, um, prostitutes go in and they challenge the new anti-prostitution law by saying that there is a constitution guarantee that's a right to trade and profession. Prostitution is the world's oldest profession. Mm -hmm. You have to have my rights protected. Is prostitution legal in India? Um, you can, uh, as an individual, engage as a, as a woman in engaging services, but what's illegal or what was illegal in the 50s was um, both uh, soliciting mm -hmm. so, uh, or organized prostitution. But uh, the way the law was crafted was uh, if there was a space where there's more than one woman engaging in prostitution, it is a brothel and therefore is organized prostitution. Mm -hmm. So one of the women that I look at comes to court and says, I am a prostitute and, it's, and so is my sister and we live in the same house. So effect and, and, and in the house live my mother and my children and this new law has converted them into criminals as well because they're living off the earnings of prostitution and it's converted my house into a criminal space so I'm, you know, I can't practice my profession if, you, if I can't stay in my house. Mm -hmm. So there was a real sense that this new law, this, this, this right to profession has no meaning because effectively this new law is shutting it down, which is what the reformers actually intended. Mm -hmm. And they were horrified when women like um, uh, Husna Bai in this case come to court and, and make these claims. Um, the courts are very conflicted and, and eventually they hold, well, while prostitution, you have a right to practice prostitution, to prostitution, it cannot overcome sort of the state's interests in protecting health and morality. Mm -hmm. So that right doesn't hold. But what really works in these cases, because their rights claims isn't working, is that they make a claim about um, how government should follow certain kind of process in a republic. So this is a democratic government. It's bound by rules. You cannot have disaggregated power given to a bureaucrat or to a local magistrate. Mm -hmm. So under the prostitution laws, your local uh, officer could decide uh, any decide that this woman is a prostitute and ask her to sort of leave uh, leave the neighborhood. And the courts sort of start regulating the behavior of these office bearers. So they say the strict guidelines is what you can do. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of description you can follow. And then these um, these procedures then become followed in other instances as well, when mm -hmm. cases involve uh, you know businessmen or, uh, or or citizens who are not engaged in um, you know, um, uh, marginal professions. So in a way, the, these rules get worked out in these mm -hmm. hard cases. It must be, I mean, an overwhelming amount of work to, you know, to hear these cases and then create all of those yeah. rules. It seems mind-boggling almost. For the judiciary? Yeah. Yes, and um, that's one of the reasons why the Indian legal system is rife with delays. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always, it, it has always been a problem um, cases take a long time and today, um, uh, I mean one of the, the Chief Justice a couple of years said that if the Supreme Court had to clear all the cases they had at the moment, it would take 20 to 30 years. My goodness. Uh, and this is when they hear, uh, I mean they give about 20, 12, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the exact figure is, mm -hmm. but they hear about thousands of cases every year as opposed to the hundred say the US Supreme Court hears. Wow. Uh, but in the 50s they weren't that over, o overburdened mm -hmm. and again this is why the Constitution becomes important is if you're filing a constitutional case, a writ petition, uh, you get to jump the queue. So uh, in many cases, uh, supposing you're a woman who's being evicted by um, the town because they suspect that you're a prostitute, um, you would file a, a civil suit of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would take 15 years to get decided. Wow. And it would cost a lot. But if you file a constitutional fundamental rights petition, you jump queue and you get heard in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. so, so why didn't everyone do that then? They, they did. And, oh, okay. and this is sort of a <laughs> rapid sort of, sort, sort of shift to it. Um, I, I don't look into it very much, but a lot of lawyers try to convert income tax cases into fundamental uh, rights okay. cases and the courts try to clamp it down. Uh -huh. Uh, but the real litigation explosion happens about 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 20 years later. So, uh, 50s still the courts seem to be managing and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and delivering this. Right, um, right. So, and, sorry. what about um, in doing your research? Did you come across anything that shocked you or surprised you that um, you just didn't expect? Lots. So perhaps I'll, I should tell a little bit about how my research was done. Sure. Um, um, so ordinarily, um, the constitution when it's studied in India is studied by lawyers uh, who read judgments. So these are published and available in the library. But um, as a historian, I was interested in looking at a, a sort of larger world around these cases. So looking for the original case files themselves, mm -hmm. which were supposed to be there in court. Um, and uh, uh, it took me, I mean, the, the, while the courts hold these files, they've not been used as an archive. So it, takes a lot, a lot of persuasion to actually get access to it. Okay. And, and being a lawyer, I went in thinking that this was, you know, um, um, 
an easy story, right? You go to court and you file a challenge and, you know, this is a, a clever way of winning. But just working in the court and as someone who went in with access, um, the difficulties that even I faced trying to get hold of documents, it made me realize how tough it must have been for all these litigants. So the fact that they went to court, it's not, it wasn't an easy decision to make. It was a hard decision and the fact that they went up all the way and they won meant that, um, you know, they really invested time, effort and energy into making that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what seemed to have been an obvious story for me actually became a more interesting, more complex story. Uh, what was also surprising is that a lot of cases that seemed to be a case brought by an individual, um, I mean, just looking at the material around seemed to be, it's actually a case being brought by a group. Mm -hmm. So again, to go back to this case involving prostitute, there are two cases filed in two different cities on the same day both by these virtually identical cases of these women who say, we live in this household mm -hmm. and we live with family member and this law is making it impossible for us to live. Um, but simultaneously you hear the story of, uh, in the paper about a dancing girls union that's being formed mm -hmm. and police reports about how uh, women in red light districts are collecting money from customers to file a lawsuit. Oh my so goodness. there's a sense that this is actually a community of prostitutes who are organizing right. uh, to sort of take the state to court. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got interested as to, and this happened in several of my cases, so, uh, so why, do certain, why are certain marginal groups able to organize and, and, and come through? So I found two elements to it. One, of course, is uh, sort of counterintuitive. So you don't see peasants or farmers coming to court in large numbers. You don't see middle class women coming to court in large numbers. But you see these sort of people who are on the edges of, 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 the, of the economy, edges of society coming mm -hmm. in. And, and I think partly this is because in some ways they have higher legal consciousness. So for years they've been regulated by the state in many ways right. as, a, as, a, as a street vendor or a beggar or a prostitute to deal with many more regulations than middle class housewife. You, you have contact with the police. You have con you've probably had to hire a lawyer in the past. So in a way it's easier for you to move. And secondly, there's a story about caste, uh, which, um, so several of these groups are professional groups mm -hmm. uh, and um, they often belong to the same caste. So there's a sense that the caste allows you, forms a network which allows information to flow and in some cases actually gives you resources uh, to, uh, to fight the case. Right. So the butchers who organize, there are 3,000 butchers and they all belong to the same community mm -hmm. and it's clear that the community is organizing right. to sort of challenge, challenge this law. Very interesting. Okay, final question. How does the constitution of the 1950s compare with the constitution in India today? Um, that's, that's a great question and it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm still sort of pulling out mm -hmm. or, or, or the roots. Um, I think why the 50s are interesting is it's a moment of uncertainty and it's a moment of dealing with a new system. Sure. So uh, no one, uh, I mean neither the judges nor the government nor the litigants really knew what was going to happen once a case went into court. Rules were being formulated all the time. Uh, so it's a sense of, of, of a new system being created. Uh, and today we know what the answer is. So today uh, there's a sense that the Indian constitution, it's, um, uh, so the Supreme Court is very powerful. Uh, it's hard for the government to sort of change things. There are delays built in the system. All of these weren't sort of evident there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, initially, uh, very often when the court would make a decision that went against the government, the government would try to overturn the decision by either changing policy or even amending the constitution. Mm -hmm. They've sort of stopped doing that now because th those rules have been built in. Uh, but also in the 50s, there's a sense that, uh, I mean, the, the courts are emptier, it's easier to, to fight cases. And um, there's a real sense of possibility, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I find sort of, sort of refreshing to go back, go back, go back and look at. Right, um, right. Yeah. Very good. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here today and sharing some of your work. Thanks, Marla. For more information about Professor Day and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.